Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I'm going to present the 10th and final lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of the musculoskeletal system. We're going to talk about neoplasms of bones and joints. And this could be a very long lecture if we wanted to go into all the various subtypes. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk in generalities about many of these tumors, give you my opinion on these tumors, and I'm going to refer you to the excellent books that are out there, whether it's Mutants, Neoplasms of Domestic Species, Chubb, Kennedy, and Palmer, uh, even the, uh, the Foundation's own fascicle on bones and joints, which is getting a little long in the tooth, and we're expecting an update within the next couple of years, and you'll want to make sure that you look out for that. Before I do, I want to talk about uh, all the wonderful people, especially Dr. Stephen Weisbrod and Dr. Paul Stromberg, uh, who have provided great images for these lectures, among so many others. I couldn't do it without them, and I thank them so much for allowing me to use their images to put these lectures together. No self-respecting lecture on neoplasm of the musculoskeletal system wouldn't start out with osteosarcoma. And we could talk about all the different variants, the slowly progressive parosteal osteosarcomas, the rapidly progressive telangiectatic, but the bottom line is that there are no good osteosarcomas. And many times you will be faced with histologic sections which contain areas that look like, some areas may look like hemangiosarcoma, some areas may look like chondrosarcoma, and you may see a very small area in which you see the production of osteoid from spindle cells. You know that's an osteosarcoma, and the diagnosis is going to be osteosarcoma because that diagnosis trumps everything. I'll tell you another uh, Another story from my experience on the histology of osteosarcoma. Back at the AFIP, we had the luxury of having just a wonderful lab, tremendous histopathologist. One day we took a uh, osteosarcoma from the distal femur of a Great Dane, and we mounted the entire thing. Um, and they used two plates of window glass to put it between, and we were able to get it on a microscope. And as we went around that very large slab section of an osteosarcoma, we were able to identify every type, every subtype of osteosarcoma in the book. They were all there in that same one, which shows how important sampling is. You may look at one part of an osteosarcoma and get something that is very uh, aggressive looking and maybe a very aggressive subtype. You may do another one that appears to be primarily fibroblastic or something that's not very aggressive. Um, so I don't put as much stock in the various types as, as many other pathologists. But there is no good osteosarcoma. Um, and here is one that you can see in the head of the humerus, which is one of the areas that dogs are predisposed to get them. And once osteosarcomas get out of the medullary cavity, when they breach that cortical bone, they're off to the races. They metastasize. That is when they get into the lungs and into the adjacent lymph nodes, but they have to breach the, uh, the cortical bone first. About 10% of dogs will actually have radiographic evidence of pulmonary metastasis at, uh, at presentation. Uh, in the dog, they tend to arise primarily in the forelimbs, two to one predilection for the forelimbs, and uh, they generally arise in the metaphysis. And it's a little different when we get to cats, um, although this is one, this is one in a, uh, a long bone of a cat appears to be the distal femur, and this is in the metaphysis and epiphysis, but many of them in cats you will see that they will, uh, they will turn up in the diaphysis, not so much in the dog. So if you go back and review the literature, it's always, you know, distal radius, proximal humerus, it's always at the end of the bones. Not so in cats, and in cats they're far less likely to metastasize. You can see them in uh, the flat bones of cats, and we will take a look at some that have been uh, associated uh, over the years with retroviral infection. Um, cats also tend to survive much longer. 
uh, literature uh, is all sort of all over the place, but cats have about a 50-month median survival time following amputation versus uh, less than a year in the dog. So it's very different between dogs and cats, and I don't want to say that uh, that's where we see, that is where we see most of our cases, but you can also see them in uh, horses. Here's one from a horse as well. Uh, most important things to remember about osteosarcomas. If you're a surgical pathologist, um, always ask for radiographs. One of the things that I always do with any bone lesion or tooth lesion, any hard, hard substance, is I want to see a radiograph. Okay, just getting a sliver of bone can be very, very difficult because a lot of times the surgeons will simply do something that is very superficial. Very few of them have bone needles, so they're using something like a 14-gauge needle or whatever, and uh, oftentimes you will get a lot of proliferative bone adjacent to a neoplasm. You may not get it. So it can be very difficult. When you get these little slivers, boy, that's tough. If you get a good radiograph, and hold off for that radiograph. When you get the case, call and say, do you have any radiographs you can send me? Because you want to know, is that going to be, uh, is that a, a moth-eaten lesion with proliferation and lysis of bone? Um, or is that a very proliferative lesion, which suggests that it might be benign? Um, don't be afraid if you don't have, everybody wants to give a good diagnosis. I've given out more than my share of fibro-osseous lesions on small biopsies over the years because I just couldn't tell. Okay, so uh, um, the diagnosis of osteosarcoma from gross aspect is very easy. Diagnosis from surgical biopsies uh, or cytologies, which everybody wants to send now because they're easy to retrieve and they don't require general anesthesia, it can be very confusing. So don't be afraid to hedge and make sure you have all the information that you can get on these. A tumor that over the years has been called uh, osteosarcoma, but uh, recently, well, not that recently, but not 20 years, has, everybody has sort of uh, settled on the name multilobular tumor of bone, it used to be called multilobular osteosarcoma, is a peculiar neoplasm um, that used to be called, at least in humans, chondroma rodens. Um, chondroma meaning a tumor of, of bone or cartilage, rodens meaning how it gnawed into the, uh, into the bone. And it particularly affects the head or the skull of, uh, of affected animals you can see and the occiput is a great spot to see this in medium or large breed dogs but you can see it anywhere in the bone of the skull including uh, along the midline you can see it on the hard palate um, and it's called multilobular and you can get a sense of that because when you look at it histologically you see these multiple well delineated lobules which are surrounded by fibrous connective tissue contain cartilage and bone in sort of these repeating units they're all not beautiful some they are uh, sort of disorganized and you have to work hard to get there but knowing it's from the skull of a dog especially the occiput will certainly help and this one seems to have a a, a, a very thickened uh, uh, cranium over it i'm not sure how much of this is bone probably a significant part some of it might be a uh, uh, new bone or woven bone but when these appear in the occiput you can see that eventually they're going to grow forward, they're going to compress the cerebellum, the brainstem, the cerebrum, cause significant neurologic signs. These, although they are low-grade malignancies and they will metastasize very late in the course of the disease, generally tend to act more like a benign tumor resulting in signs due to compression of the underlying brain rather than an incidence of, uh, of metastasis. I probably see a lot more biopsies of osteosarcoma than I do of osteoma, either because, and I think it's likely that uh, um, when you see a radiograph of something that is primarily bone, it's hanging off of the flat bones, uh, whether it's the skull, maybe it's the scapula or a vertebra, um, it has smooth margins and it's just bright like the sun. People recognize that 
as osteomas, they're much less likely to biopsy and hopefully more likely to excise, especially in this ferret, which has a, you know, a sort of narrow neck. And, and I think that they might have just, a good surgeon would just have taken, uh, you know, uh, something and, and cut it off um, or knocked it off with a chisel. But a lot of people don't want to do that when they're diffusely involved in the underlying bone. People tend to uh, uh, tend to shy away from that. But the difference between, if you look at this radiograph, and I know we're pathologists, but it's all images, folks, and always ask for that radiograph. And there's really no doubt that this is almost all bone. It's not a bunch of spindle cells making some osteoid. It is well-delineated bone, and that's where I would say, you know, we're dealing with an osteoma here. And one of my favorite pictures is somebody, and I said, I really want the picture of this one. Here was the radiograph. Bright like the sun, it's all bone. This animal, they put it down, and then they quickly opened it up the animal. The owner did, and uh, isolated that tumor so I could get a picture. Osteomas, more common in, in certain species like ferrets than osteosarcomas. Um, I just don't see a lot of, of biopsies on because I think that they are readily diagnosable. Another neoplasm that... Uh, is coming off the flat bone and often comes off the flat bone is this large chondrosarcoma. It has sort of a multilobular gelatinous sort of silverish appearance like you would imagine uh, proliferating uh, chondrocytes to, to look like. Um, we looked at osteochondromas uh, in a, a previous lecture, which are just little parts of the growth plate which have been left behind and will form cartilage. But this is an older dog, probably a large breed dog, and dogs and sheep are overrepresented. We don't see a lot of chondrosarcomas. I certainly don't, and a lot of the ones I get excited about, eventually I find osteosarcoma in them. But uh, the literature uh, reports that there are about 10% of primary bone tumors in the dog. So the ribs, the pelvis, the nasal bones, these are all sort of overrepresented flat bones that you see, and they often arise in the medullary cavity. This one um, is probably, uh, I don't know if it's arising off of this or there's another rib in here that has probably just been subsumed by this gigantic tumor. They can be fairly tough. They tend not to, uh, uh, not to have a lot of cellular criteria of malignancy, so they're very variably microscopically. Some have a large amount of matrix. Um, some you will see the clusters of really abnormal clusters of cells. It can be sort of tricky, but you see something this big, I think I'm going with a chondrosarcoma. And um, the really malignant ones tend to have a lot of necrosis and hemorrhage. This is another one where radiographs will help you as well in, differenti in differentiating this from osteosarcoma. Okay, I mentioned it earlier about osteosarcomas in cats that arise from feline leukemia, feline retrovirus. Uh, there used to be a form, we don't see it much anymore now that we are vaccinating in the U.S. and Europe and Australia for feline leukemia. A lot of the really good tumors like this are gone, but there was a variant of the retrovirus that uh, was called the feline sarcoma virus, which would give rise to neoplasms on the flat bones. Now, these go by a lot of different names depending on the progression of them. Um, they tend to arise in the periosteum, and initially when they're small, they've been referred to as osteochondromas because it looks like they're just benign proliferations of uh, bone and cartilage, and they develop in mature animals. So you're not going to confuse it with the uh, osteochondroma or multiple cartilaginous exostoses in young animals, which tend to, uh, tend to stop growing at the physial closure time. These tend to keep growing and growing and growing. Um, and as they, the animal gets older and the virus continues to replicate, you can find the, the virus in this lesion if you ever see one of these lesions again. Um, they do undergo obvious malignant uh, transformation. Because they arise in the periosteum, they are not contiguous with the marrow cavity um, as opposed to traditional osteosarcomas in dogs and horses. And yeah, this is just an absolutely great picture of one of these fully grown uh, 
osteosarcomas arising from feline retrovirus infection. Okay, there's a whole lot of different tumors that can get to bone. And we don't have time to talk about all of them. I want to talk about some interesting ones. Um, one that's a classic in the dog um, is one that arises from the jaws, especially the maxilla of large breed dogs. First identified, I think, in golden retrievers, but most of the retrievers have seen them. And other, you'll see large breed dogs. But goldens, um, Dobermans, and German Shepherds are are affected. And um, it is now known as the maxillary fibrosarcoma. It's a form of periosteal fibrosarcoma that is very special for a number of reasons. One, it is very poorly cellular. It looks like a fibroma. And the first time this was published, and for a while after that, this was called the biologic, what was it? The, um, the histologically benign behaviorally malignant fibrosarcoma. That was a mouthful, but it did look under the microscope very benign. You didn't see hardly any mitotic figures. There are a few cells, very thin nuclei, but it did eat the dog's face off. Um, now it's just referred to as maxillary fibrosarcoma. Um, about a third of the fibrosarcomas, and they're common in the jaws, will arise in this particular location. Um, they're also unusually susceptible to radiation, much more than your average fibrosarcoma. So, uh, maxillary fibrosarcoma used to be the histologically benign, behaviorally malignant fibrosarcoma, which told you a lot about the tumor, but just was too much for everyone to remember. Here's an absolutely fantastic picture by Dr. Lois Roth when she was at Angel Memorial Animal Hospital. And I want you to just to go back to uh, when you were in veterinary school and they showed you pictures of a bone, especially a flat bone. It might be a vertebra, might be the spinous process of a vertebra, but you can also see them in long bones. And it looked like there were holes in it. And this is exactly what you were seeing. And this is plasma cell myeloma, myeloma, multiple myeloma, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they very characteristically um, have a symbiotic relationship between plasma cells and osteoclasts. So in the areas of plasma cells, with concentrated plasma cells, you often see a lot of osteoclasts resorbing bones. So that's why they look punched out. And there's a bunch of things that you want to see when you look at these. Histologically, um, when you section this, um, it's the bone marrow is not going to be all plasma cells. 30%. 30% is what you need because a lot of this out here is going to be normal marrow, but you're going to see these concentrations. And so 30% is a pretty good rule for how many plasma cells does it make to make myeloma. And of course, the more of these diagnostic criteria you find, the better it's going to be. Okay, radiographic evidence of osteolysis. Yeah, you want to see these punched out areas. And you can see this in a number of bones. Okay, a lot of the rest are sort of clin path abnormalities that you're going to see because these uh, plasma cells make antibodies. You're going to see uh, proteinuria, which is generally due to light chains produced by the neoplastic plasma cells, and they pass through the glomerular membrane. So this animal is going to have proteinuria, and then if you do a phoresis on this, it, they're all going to be the same. They're all going to be the same light chains. Um, if you do it in the blood, we call that a monoclonal gammopathy. You're going to have a huge spike in your plasmapheresis of the, uh, uh, of the gamma globulins. And if you look really closely, um, they're all going to be exactly the same because they're all coming from the same neoplastic uh, clone of plasma cells. And then a couple of other things that you will see, uh, associated lesions with hyperglobulinemia, like platelet dysfunction and uh, uh, renal amyloidosis, hyperviscosity, too much, uh, if you get too much uh, antibodies, then uh, yeah, it's, it's, the blood is going to be very sludgy. And then because of the fact that osteoclasts are resorbing all of this uh, all of this bone, you may also see hypercalcemia. So that's a, a bunch of good things to think about. Monoclonal gammopathy, light chain proteinuria with or without glomerular lesions, hypercalcemia, uh, osteolysis, and then you absolutely want to take a, uh, a sam sample of this bone and look for 30, eh, maybe, let's just say a third will be plasma cells. 
Okay, another great concept. Uh, I don't even know what type of tumor this is. I'm betting it's carcinoma because 60% of humans, and this is well documented, have metastasis of carcinoma to the bones at autopsy. And when we have widespread neoplasia in a dog because of search satisfaction, we see it all over the place and we don't start cutting in the bones unless you, you know, somebody. Uh, early on did some sort of scintigraphy and uh, and documented or the animal has bone pain but a lot of people will stop because they, they know they can get the answer but if you don't look you'll never see and I do strongly recommend in animals with disseminated carcinoma cutting in some of the bones especially in cats and this looks like a cat bone the appendicular skeleton is predisposed um, and there's also a paper written a while ago, and this might need updating, but uh, in 50% of widespread carcinomas in the dog, primaries won't be found. And that's sort of, I don't know if my experience, because all the military working dogs that are military veterinarians doing in the field, they do a great job of the autopsies. I don't think we're quite aside, but I can tell you there have been a number of cases where I've never found where the, the primary carcinoma was. It wasn't well differentiated. It was everywhere, including the bones, and those can be tough. Maybe the best known uh, form of metastasis is in cats and pulmonary carcinoma will often metastasize to bone, especially the bones of a digit. And I think it's because, especially in the small bones, you have these hairpin-like turns. They tend to, uh, they tend to, large tumor emboli tend to get stuck. Um, but you can also see, uh, see them in muscle. You can see them, uh, they metastasize often interarterially, and they get stuck in the muscle bellies. Um, so this is pulmonary carcinoma. There is nothing special about pulmonary carcinoma. I would expect a lot of different carcinomas to turn up like this in cats. Now the bone uh, is a great place for metastasis of other type of neoplasms. This is melanoma uh, in the bone of a broiler chicken from Lyndon Craig from her paper on metastatic melanoma in broiler chickens and those were just all over the place in the heart and the lungs liver bone is not going to be spared once again if you don't look you'll never find it another species very commonly uh, gets melanoma is horses uh, melanoma in horses, and we've covered this when we talked about horses, and we've covered it in the skin. Uh, melanomas in horses, we see it a lot in older horses. If the horse generally has a graying gene, if it's a old, the old gray mare, if it's a liposonal horse, or ones that tend, they tend to be able to carry a much larger tumor burden than brown horses. Brown horses die quickly with widespread metastasis. When you get these old liposoners or these gray horses, um, They've got tumors all over the place. You know, they got it up through the perianal area into the vertebral canal. This one had uh, uh, extensive metastasis into the feet, uh, all three of the phalanges as well. Just a fantastic picture. One of my favorite tumors in the bone is lymphoma in young calves, calves with juvenile lymphoma. You often see... Uh, extensive infarction of the red marrow and nothing else looks like this to me it looks like a beautiful mosaic here's another one right here you can see the lymphoma up you know dissecting off the periosteum but you still have that beautiful very well defined areas of mostly infarction that's why it has such nice borders but there's tumor cells in there as well and nothing nothing looks like this tumor associated ischemic bone lesions. I don't want to get uh, too deep into uh, uh, bone tumors of the jaws, but I will say that if you see a tumor um, in the, the front of the jaw of a large animal, a horse or a cow, first thing that I'm going to think of, not the only thing, but the first thing I'm going to think about are ossifying fibromas, also known as cemento-ossifying fibromas, peripheral 
uh, ossifying fibromas, and there's a lot of different categories. I lump, tend to lump them all together, but this is a neoplasm that often shows up um, in the mandible of horses and cattle. Not the only one, but uh, um, it's a really good spot for them. Now, another thing about horses. If you have a tumor in the mouth of a horse or a tumor going up into the sinuses of a horse, nine times out of ten you're going to be dealing with squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, in my particular experience, it is the the, they arise from the, the squamous epithelium that lines the alveolus. There's a thin line of epithelium down there, you know, between the, the gum proper and the tooth. And this seems to cause all sorts of crazy squamous cell carcinomas. And they're always bizarre, and I got a lot of second opinions. And it's just squamous cell carcinoma. The other thing that can fool you, oh, wait. I got one more. That's a great picture from North Carolina State University. I'm going to thank John Cullen from that. One of his graduate students took this picture. What a fantastic way to section a horse's head. But you can see this gigantic squamous cell carcinoma coming out of the teeth. So horses, jaws, think squamous cell carcinoma first. Um, don't be afraid to think about uh, a, another tumor that is number one in uh, uh in cattle, and that's ameloblastomas or ameloblastic fibromas. These have gone through a lot of different names. Um, I like the one back in the in the day, back in the 60s. They used to call these adamantinomas. Sounds like something out of a comic book. Um, but um, these are neoplasms with uh, that have palisading uh, odontogenic epithelium in no particular uh, structure at all. And they are very uh, invasive, and they cause tooth loss. And it's a biggie in cattle, and it's probably number two in the jaws of horses. So think about that. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about joint tumors very shortly, because this is something that gets very controversial, and I'm going to come down on uh, one side for many Welcome years. Alexa Prize, a university competition to advance AI. Alexa, stop. Not sure what I said, but Alexa didn't like it. Okay, so one thing I want you to see about this particular tumor is it is invading the bone of this dog, yes, but it's also a very large neoplasm that is crossing the joint. And one thing osteosarcomas will not do is they do not cross joints. When you have a tumor that crosses the joint, affecting the bones on either side, you need to think of about something other than osteosarcoma. And traditionally, a lot of these were lumped into the category of synovial cell tumor, which is a human tumor of synovial, synovial fibrocyte origins. But the problem is this tumor sometimes will express keratin, and it most often expresses markers for histiocytes. And I am going to come down on the side of those who believe that synovial cell sarcoma is a disease of humans. I do not believe that uh, a sarcoma should express keratin or histiocyte markers. I think the vast majority of these, number one um, of the joint, are going to end up being histiocytic sarcomas. So. Um, you'll be hard-pressed to ever get a diagnosis of synovial cell sarcoma. It doesn't mean these aren't aggressive tumors. And sometimes we, we kid ourselves that whether we diagnose synovial cell sarcoma or histiocytic sarcoma, we're, you know, giving the dog extra time or being more specific. That's a bad tumor for either of those to have. But I, nowadays I run the histiocytic markers on all of them, and most of them will light up for some of the histiocyte markers. So I'm on the, the side of histiocytic sarcoma, but you will hear people that will very eloquently expound for synovial cell sarcoma. Just be aware that there is that controversy. Does synovial cell sarcoma even exist in veterinary species? Just another great picture of a histiocytic sarcoma. These are thought to arise from the Langerhans cells of the 
synovial membrane. And something that they don't have in common with synovial sarcomas in humans is the presence of a lot of other inflammatory cells throughout these neoplasms. They're usually replete with lymphocytes and, and plasma cells and all that. But look how it's crossing the joint, infiltrating the bone on, on both sides. So when I see something like that, um, I'm going uh, synovial. I'm sorry, <laughs> now I've gotten nuts. Um, I'm going histiocytic sarcoma. And finally, our last joint tumor is number two. Um, and if you look at this, it sort of crosses the joint too, but the joint is the joint space is very swollen with this bubbly material. Another great picture from Lyndon Craig. And this is a synovial myxoma. Uh, some people will call them synovial myxosarcomas. They can be very big and extensive. They don't have a lot of uh, criteria of malignancy. They don't metastasize. Um, Dr. Craig uh, reported almost 40 cases of these. Usually it's large breed uh, middle-aged dogs and uh, Dobermans and Labrador Retrievers are most commonly affected with the stifle and digits being the most common sites and they, they just are composed of these gelatinous uh, nodules and they don't have uh, the minority, about 30% have any evidence of bone changes or invasive growth. So they tend to uh, expand the joint, produce this viscous fluid. And uh, they do come with very long survival times, which is, you know, the opposite of the dogs with the histiocytic sarcoma, even with incomplete recurrence in, uh, or incomplete excision and local recurrence. They do uh, last for a long time. So synovial myxoma. Remember that. Great case uh, was in Wednesday's Slide Commerce just a couple of years ago. Okay. Well, if Alexa has no more interruptions, I think this brings us to the last slide of this particular lecture series. I hope that you have enjoyed it. Um, it's been fun for me. Please make it a habit to come to the Joint Pathology Center's video library or the Foundation's Facebook page or YouTube channel. Uh, in, next week, I will be starting on the gross pathology of the cardiovascular system. So I look forward to putting that together, putting that out there for you, and I want to thank you so much for uh, tuning in and, and sharing some of your time with me. Everybody, have a great day.